This video was brought to you by the fine patrons on my Patreon page. These videos are totally ad-free, and if you like this content, take a look at the Patreon page in the description below and consider donating to keep this channel growing. On to the video. So I recently finished Mass Effect 1 in preparation for this video, and I came to a stunning realization. I have never in any of my eight or so playthroughs of this game allowed the council to die because I had never seen that particular ending. It took me by surprise. I couldn't tell you why, it doesn't make sense, I just could never allow myself to do it. Let them die, that is. I realized that it was likely because I was playing RPGs for a bit of escapism from my daily work, eat, sleep, repeat lifestyle that seen me only living for the weekends. Some people find escape in their daily work, but I've never been so lucky. My whole life up to recently was a search for meaning. I joined the army because I thought it would help me find that meaning. It did not. I moved to California because I thought I'd find my meaning there. I did not. Turns out you can't find meaning without turning your eyes from the outside to the inside. Without a critical eye, you may never find out who you are. Wish I would have figured that out a little sooner. Mass Effect 1 was an easy escape. A way to immerse myself in the shoes of a man who did what was right, was heroic, and did what needed to be done. It was a way to escape from the impotence I felt in my daily life. Looking back on those experiences, I overlooked flaws easily because those flaws were just standing in the way of the world-altering choices I got to make. But why the hell did I spend so many playthroughs doing the same thing over and over again? In every playthrough, I promised myself I would do a renegade run, and I just couldn't do it because, at the heart of me, I didn't like inflicting pain on others unless those people absolutely deserved it. This time around, however, I committed to a renegade run-through. Sort of. I mean, I didn't kill the Rachni because, well, I knew what happens in Mass Effect 3, and there didn't seem to be a point, and besides, I killed the bug in my first playthrough. This time, when it came to the decision of letting the Council live, or letting them die, I let them die. And I was completely okay with it. It wasn't because it was a video for a review and I had somehow become detached from the reality or dispassionate about the game, which is admittedly easy to do when you're doing this kind of video. No, in fact, Renegade Shepard was growing on me. His mindset was slowly encroaching upon my decision making in the game as if his brain was becoming my brain. Empathy was helping me cope with his way of thinking. Let me explain. When I played my Paragon choices, the game was feeding me the logic of the character I was playing. I always say that empathy and hate come through experience, so the more time you spend with someone, the more you either grow to like or hate them. The more that I was exposed to the logic of Good Boy Shepard, the more I identified with his particular way of thinking. Sort of like the social and news media bubbles I talked about in my hypernormalization video. The more I chose to be good, the more of his opinions I heard on the subject, the more I began to identify with him. In fact, at least in the game world, I felt like I was becoming him. Doing this renegade run was much the same. With the Paragon Shepherd, I was trying to get the council to see the truth, and even though they stood in my way, I saw the importance of a council that represented the whole universe of species, because this closely coincides with my own personal beliefs. I was easily indoctrinated. But with the Renegade run, it was much harder to adopt for me. In fact, I was more Paragon early on in this run than Renegade, but the more Shepard spoke in his no-nonsense approach, the more I began to see his point. The Council was biased. They did see humanity as children, even though we were saving them. And the more that Shepard pointed out that they were doing it, the more I resented them for it. Renegade Shep is a fantastic rhetorician. When the choice to let them live or let them die came around, I made what I felt was a logical choice. I let them die so a new council could be born in their place. A council that would, given all that we had done, respect us. The game still allowed me to protest. I said, I didn't make this choice just so you can go and go for a power grab for humanity. We need to restore the council. But the die was cast. Once men get power, they will never give it up peacefully. And in a way, I saw their point, but I knew that humanity was ambitious, perhaps too much. And this power grab was their way of skipping all the important steps of earning respect. 
I have a deep connection with Mass Effect 1, but why do I always say that I like Mass Effect 2 better? Mass Effect 2, instead of looking within its own systems for inspiration as to what it could improve, instead looked outside itself to the industry as a whole, believing that it could recreate the lightning in a bottle that Mass Effect 1 was. But did it find meaning out there, or did it need to do some soul searching first? Well, let's dig in, shall we? Let's start with what I think is the feature that got the most love, and that is combat. Lots of criticisms have been levied at this game's combat system, and a lot of it isn't really fair, but the thing I hardly hear about is how the removal of a manual crouch button brainwashes people into believing this game can't be played without hitting space to put your back against cover. And because the game starts you off in a room with nothing but waist-high walls, if you want to survive that first encounter, you better be real quick with headshots or hit the space bar like a good boy. In fact, of the first five things the game tutorial tells you to do, three of them involve crouching behind cover, and in the first real fight with several enemies, you cannot proceed forward unless you crouch on the arrow. When the game finally introduces you to cover that isn't waist high, the game has already hammered home the importance of cover so much with the almost exclusive waist high cover, the player becomes used to this and believes that it's in his best interest to play this way. And that just couldn't be further from the truth. The reality is, cover can get you killed, especially when it takes precious seconds to break cover in order to retreat from blitz-type enemies like Husks or Krogan. So the criticism that this game relies on waist-high cover too much is actually the fault of the removal of crouching manually, and all the bad messaging in a tutorial mission. Once again, a tutorial mission meant to help new players is brainwashing the playing public into believing something that just simply isn't true. But you might be asking, why do you hate taking cover in this game so much? Well, third-person shooters are tiresome, because they require you to do a set of repetitive tasks over and over again in order to succeed. After the 30th or so encounter, the player experiences fatigue with the system because it is limiting the movement and choice the player has in how they tackle a given situation. Combat in reality has about four pillars according to the NBC Operations and Fundamentals of Army Operations Manual. Those four pillars are maneuvering, firepower, protection, and leadership. Let's look at these fundamentals and see if Mass Effect 2's combat holds water. First is maneuvering. As far as I'm concerned, maneuvering in this game is solid, but this also depends heavily on the class you've picked. Vanguard, for instance, can cover a lot of ground very quickly with a biotic teleport. It can help you pick off stragglers or to close distance with a shotgun on a group of squishies. Infiltrator has the ability to cloak and move about from cover to cover unseen, which allows for a ton of maneuverability and any class with the barrier ability is free to move anytime their shields is up. But if your back is against the wall, you're going to have a terrible time. Luckily, even though this game removed the maneuver that is a staple of every shooter that I can remember, which is the crouch button, there is plenty of tall cover for which you can peek out from behind and score that headshot. In my opinion, maneuvering in this game is solid and is a slight step up from the previous game. However, the removal of crouch really gets on my damn nerves. Sometimes you just want to drop it low. Maneuvering is not just about how you move, but also where you move is important. An effective commander always moves his troops to positions which will prove advantageous to victory. This is where level design comes in. Does the level design facilitate things like high ground and power positions, kill zones, and death funnels? Well, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Let's take a look at some examples. On the Horizon mission, we get a look at some of the great work that Bioware did with both small and large arenas. Take the first encounter, for instance. Notice that there are three routes through this area. One that is very safe to the right, which gives you the ability to easily flank an enemy. An area in the middle that is open, but relatively less safe, since husks and sometimes flank you on a position to the left. Then the third route is to your left. This route looks more exposed, but the high ground allows you to snipe over cover. Position in this level is key, and the design gives you a great amount of choice in how you push forward. Compare this now to the design of most of Mass Effect 1's encounters, and Mass Effect 2's design looks downright open-ended. The second encounter is designed in a square, and gives you two options to proceed, but three options for cover. The small building to the left, the building to the right, and a sparse cover in the middle. 
This is a more straightforward area, but it still gives you options. The third encounter is the largest of the three. The area contains three paths forward and several ways to flank the enemy and for the enemy to flank you. I've played through this area several times and each time the Scion took a different path to fight me. It's also in the third encounter that we start to see a pattern. What do all three of these areas have in common, you might ask? Loops. Lovely, curvaceous loops. If these gameplay examples show anything, they should show that, depending on your abilities, that maneuverability is not a problem in this game. If the player is constantly stuck behind cover, the player may be the problem, not the game. Next is Firepower. Firepower has taken, arguably, the biggest hit in this iteration of Mass Effect. The weapon selection in this game is dreadfully anemic. Take this list of weapons, for example. Heavy Weapons has a total of five, and are usually only used in life or death situations. But as for the main weapons, the ones you will be using the most, Assault Rifles have the largest selection with four different types in total. The M8, the M15, the M76, and the Geth Pulse Rifle. The next largest selection is Sniper Rifles and Shotguns, who have three variants each, and Pistols and SMGs, which only come in at two flavors each. The pistol trades ammo for stopping power, and that's about the only difference. When you compare this to Mass Effect's 17 different brands of assault rifles, 17 shotguns, 17 sniper rifles, and I think you get the point. The game has hardly any different weapons. While we are on the subject of Mass Effect 1, yes, I realize that most of those choices in ME1 are not really choices, and you always go for the gun with the best stats, I get it. But the way to fix that problem wasn't to throw away choice. Even with that complaint, Mass Effect had the weapon mod system, which added a little bit more depth and choice. Mass Effect 2 did away with both of these systems and rolled the weapon mods into a handful of ammo types that act like abilities, which means that they're cut off from certain classes. The addition of heavy weapons is a welcome addition, however, but there's just not enough choice here. My reasoning is this. Mass Effect 2 introduced universal cooldowns to all abilities, which made playing as an adept a chore. This means that your primary weapon, the pistol and SMG, has only two variants. So if you don't like either of those two variants, you'll be stuck using them for a while as you wait for your abilities to come off cooldown. Adepts have even less choice than a soldier, a vanguard, or an infiltrator because they will likely be stuck waiting behind cover or busy getting flanked by a husk because they no longer have barrier. If you start as an infiltrator, it's even worse, because you don't get a different sniper rifle until late in the game. And then your choice is, do I want to one hit kill, which is the gun you start with, and run out of bullets every fight because I can only shoot the damn thing 10 times, or do I want to shoot spitballs at people and run out of bullets every fight anyway? This game needed wider choice when it came to weapons. It's as simple as that. They also got rid of grenades. Arguably the best weapon for flushing people out of cover or setting up kill zones. The worst thing about this new system is the fact that they took away weapon proficiencies. Now all weapons are slightly inaccurate forever and you can't level up Shepard's aim to make it better. The SMG will always fire in a ridiculous spread, pistol bullets and bursts will fly everywhere they want, and assault rifles are water hoses of bullets. Adepts used to be my favorite class. But in Mass Effect 2, they ruined them. Without a defensive skill, they are squishy and absolutely useless for long stretches of time due to the fact they don't have barriers or shields to get them out of trouble. If there is a barrier up on an enemy, all of your abilities are useless. So have fun shooting one of your two pistols because that is all you'll be doing a lot of. Mass Effect 2 fails in my opinion at firepower. Protection. Protection seems to come out a little better since some classes have a defensive ability to help you out when you're in danger. But the armor has been pretty much gutted. In Mass Effect 1, you had three classes of armor, light, medium, and heavy. Of these classes, there were about 16 different brands for each, for a total of 48 different types of armor with three primary stats that they affect. That being damage protection, shields, arguably the most important stack, and tech biotic protection. Again, this fell into the pitfall of most useful armor being the one with the best stats because the game did not penalize the players enough on their movement speed when they wore heavier armor. It was barely noticeable if it existed at all. 
There are about seven types of armor in Mass Effect, but with about three to five pieces to each armor variant. This means that the system was expanded while also being restricted. First, the armor, most of the time, offers very little in way of bonuses or protection. No armor set reduces incoming damage, and most armor only increments health and max shields by 10 to sometimes 15%. Again, the Adept class is the only one getting screwed here because they, by far, have the worst shields and health. To make this worse, one set of armor is only available if you own Dragon Age Origins. Another is relegated to the Collector's Edition. The Inferno and Terminus armor is pre-order only, and the Kestrel armor and Cerberus Assault armor are DLC armors. Are you getting mad yet? Because I was. That means this game only comes with one. Yeah, that's right. One armor set aside from the base armor set. Within this armor set, vanilla content only, four helmets, four chests, four shoulders, four gauntlets, and four greaves for a whopping total of 20 armor pieces. This selection is ridiculously small for an RPG, and the incremental increases the stats really make armor feel worthless. So it may seem at first glance that protection in Mass Effect is terrible, but it picks up steam once again in level design with all the body length cover and your ability to peak, and the fact that you have regenerating health and can never be one shot because you have two states, shields up, and shields down before you die. The real protection and defensive ability comes from your class abilities. The Infiltrator has Cloak, which we've talked about. The Sentinel has Tech Armor, which essentially overcharges your shields. The Soldier has Adrenaline Rush, which dilates time and gives him a 100% damage bonus, which can be used defensively to clear threats. But the rest of the classes have very little to save them from when they are out in the open, and must make good use of cover, which, by what I've said before, makes the game a drag to play. Mass Effect 2 fails only partly at the third principle of combat. Leadership. Now this game has leadership covered. Moving the commands is something that makes more sense, like Q and E keys was brilliant. But the game fails in many other ways. A common tactic of mine is to send Grunt in and blitz the enemy with a few Bukaki blasts from his shotgun. Problem is, if my reticle is close to an enemy, and I mean anywhere within a 20 foot radius, the game will think I want him to use his abilities which waste valuable time adjusting my reticle telling him where to go. Now I typically pause menu the game and aim it the long, difficult way like I did in Mass Effect 1, but even then, it still does the same thing. It's very difficult to tell people where to go when enemies are present. The AI is somewhat better now. I noticed the team AI, at least, doing a lot less stupid things, and the enemy AI gets hung up a lot less. So when I issue a command, the team usually does it. Usually. Understood. We'll end it quickly. We'll end it quickly. Going now. So the game gets points for that, but where the game falls flat on its face is in the fact that squad mates now only have a total of three abilities. Not that it matters. On veteran difficulty, this game is a cakewalk. Enemies rarely flank you, rarely rush you, and I can't tell you the last time I got hit with a stun in the game that wasn't a rocket. So they gimped the teammates, gave them less flexibility, and to compensate for this, we got a less challenging experience. The game becomes very reliant on group composition at this point and is less about how you issue your commands and more about who you take with you. Mass Effect 2, well, it seems to fail at leadership as well. But it's not all bad. Combat is more fluid with a button that allows you to break cover immediately. But just like in Mass Effect 1, if you're snapping to cover, I feel sorry for you. You don't need to do that in this game and in fact, the game is so easy that you can essentially walk out into the open and snipe, 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 your way to glory. So while this game feels like it failed in the combat pillars, making the combat more fluid and getting rid of stat-based accuracy was enough to please shooter fans, but it annoyed the hell out of long-time RPG fans. If meaningful combat depends on these four pillars, which I believe it does, 
then Mass Effect 2 destroyed what it knew about itself, hoping to find meaning in recreating itself. It did not look inside for insight, and failed at so much of what it did well previously. Is the combat a failure? No. In many ways, it's a success at being a third-person shooter, but what Mass Effect 1 did so well is that its combat was the RPG equivalent of a third-person shooter, and this is something that Mass Effect 2 clearly lost. How did the story fare in this reimagining of the Mass Effect formula? Let's talk once again about finding meaning and how we do that with Shepard and his crew of ne'er-do-wells. Mass Effect 2 doesn't often confront you with tough decisions, not until late in the game. But the decisions that you do make are of a personal scale. A one-on-one -on -one confrontation with regret, guilt, and disillusionment. People have described Mass Effect 2's story as a much darker story than the previous game, and that makes a lot of sense, since what we're dealing with are fundamentally human problems. The previous game was about an antagonist whose plot we were trying to uncover, and Mass Effect 2 is about gathering a team to take down a human trafficking ring in space. The darkness doesn't come from the main story, however. It resides in each of our companions, behind their past decisions, the things they did when no one was looking. To put it another way, we as people fumble around in the dark looking for meaning. We stumble about, we mess things up, and in that darkness, residing somewhere unexpected, we discover who we really are, for better or for worse. Nowhere else in this story is this search for meaning better represented than in the loyalty missions. Let's examine them and see how they enforce this theme. First, we'll start with what I think is the weakest example. That is Jacob's mission. This mission had a lot of potential, but it was squandered by a black and white morality that ruined any tension the choice at the end might have had. We land on a planet and find the wreckage of the Gurn's back. There is a distress beacon set up, but the distress call went out only recently, even though the ship went down over eight years ago. Listening to the logs, we find out that the vegetation on the planet confuses people and causes neural degradation, amnesia, and so on. Another log points out that people forget within minutes things that people did to them. It is insinuated that people took advantage of this, especially with the women. We find out that Ronald Taylor, Jacob's father, has set himself up like a king, hoarding the good food from the ship for himself and using the women as sex slaves in a harem he's built for himself. The other men, exiled most likely, attack him, destroy his security bots, and forced him to send out the beacon. Jacob's father went from a good man to a rotten man, but the story does not give a good reason why. It could be many things. Take this question for example. When no one is looking, and no one will hold you accountable, what would you do? Maybe he wasn't as good a man as Jacob thought, but this idea is not looked at in any meaningful way. Instead, Captain Taylor took advantage of people whose mental faculties were unable to deal with what was happening to them, and stayed stranded on that island like a despot. This is weak because the reasoning is weak. The character of Jacob's dad does not raise any interesting philosophical questions, he's just another bad man doing bad things. A simple change, however, could have raised several interesting questions, for example, what if all the people on the island were forced to eat the food, even Jacob's father? And because of this, it took years to get that beacon up. By then, everyone had decayed mentally. They forgot who they were, who they used to be, and therefore became something they didn't recognize, even Jacob's father. At the end, when Jacob decides to leave him to die or take him in to answer for his crimes, if his father was no longer who he used to be, the decision has a lot more weight because it's like temporary insanity. The question isn't, is this a bad man or a good man? The question becomes, is this man really responsible for what he became? Then your decision at the end would have a hell of a lot more impact emotionally and would force the player to make a difficult decision. Because even though he wasn't in his right mind, what he did was simply abhorrent. And maybe that darkness resided in him always, and all the toxic food did was set that part of him loose. That simple change in my opinion would have been a lot more interesting. Alright, now let's talk about Jack. Jack is an interesting, if not tragic, backstory. Her loyalty mission, unlike some of the others, doesn't involve saving any person, 
like Mordens, Jacobs, and Mirandas. At least, not right away. It is something personal, seemingly petty, something that she needs to do in order to put the past to sleep, or in her case, destroy it in a mushroom cloud. She simply wants to go to the place where she was raised, where she was experimented on, tortured, and trained to be remorseless, place a bomb in the middle of it, and blow it to pieces. Over the course of the level, which is punctuated by what is in my opinion unnecessary gunfights, and I say they're unnecessary in my opinion because they turn what should be a quiet retrospective moment about Jack's past into spectacle and bombast. Even so, along the way we find little details of the world that Jack lived in, and she comments on them, remembering her past as only she could. I never saw this room. I think they brought new kids in these containers. They were messed up and starving, but alive. Usually. And that is part of the problem. See, she only knows what she's experienced. She believes that she got the worst of all the punishments. And this may be true, but because she was kept separate from the other children... I thought that room out there was the rest of the world. I'd pound and yell. Never did any good. And made to watch them through one-sided glass, believing that she was kept in her room while others enjoyed some measure of freedom. She became resentful of them, which made them easier to kill in the arena the guards made her fight in. This looks like an arena. That's right. They used to stage fights here, pit me against other kids. I loved it. Only time I was ever out of my cell. What were they studying? Hell if I know. Maybe that's how they got their kicks. I never understood anything that happened here. How often did they do this? I was in a cell my whole life. Sometimes they took me out and made me fight. Filled me with drugs, other stuff. Time gets funny in a cell. Did other children die in these fights? I was a kid, filled with drugs. I got shocked when I hesitated. Narcotics flooded my veins when I attacked. They actually rewarded you for attacking? I still get warm feelings during a fight. What the hell was wrong with those people? They fed her narcotics when she won, as a reward, and she comments on how that warm feeling comes back whenever she kills. This is a similar tactic that you see used in warlords that use children to fight wars. This tactic even works on adults, as the endocrine system is there, in part, to encourage us to keep doing things that makes us feel good. This can be twisted into something that is not at all healthy. From this mission, we find out what Jack believed about her reality wasn't real at all. That every decision she made up until that point, even if she believed it was her decision, was a manipulation to shape her into what Cerberus wanted her to be. That's not right. I broke out when my guards disappeared. I started that riot. It looks like there was a lot you didn't know. The other kids attacked me, the guards attacked me, the automated systems attacked me. That doesn't leave lots of room for interpretation. So strange to be back here. I feel like... I'm pissed off. I'm a dangerous bitch, but then I'm a little girl again. She realizes that the glass she stood on the other side of, beating against, trying to get the attention of the other children, and believing that they were ignoring her, and that they didn't care for her, was just one-way glass. And they couldn't see her at all. This... it's a two-way mirror? My cell is on the other side. I could see all the other kids out here. I screamed at them for hours. And they always ignored me. Coming across a log that shows Cerberus was experimenting and killing children in order to keep from killing Jack sends her into denial mode, the first stage of grief. This is bullshit. They weren't experimenting on the other children for my safety. This whole place was built to turn you into what you are. You don't get it, Shepard. I survived this place because I was tougher than the rest. That's who I am. You move on, harder and tougher. Then we come to Jack's cell and we meet Aresh. Aresh is the same as Jack in many ways, yet turned out different. Two people, under similar yet not exact conditions, turned out different and came to a different conclusion. Aresh is searching for meaning outside of himself. He wants to rebuild the facility to find out why he was tortured. There had to be some reason. In a way, he believes that if the reason was good enough, then the treatment he endured was worth it. He believed that he could find closure in this, but the reality is that it would only open him up for more questions. Jack, on the other hand, is looking at herself, 
her memories, realizing and finally accepting that what happened to her was not as she remembered it. And with the explosion and the destruction of her past, she could finally move on because it was truly dead and gone. A ghost of the past vanished. I needed to wipe that place off the map. You took me there to do it and I owe you. You don't know what it's like, Shepard, to have garbage like that following you. It marks you in ways you... you don't expect. I've made a lot of hard choices, Jack. Like what to let go. Hard to walk away from it. You'd think it would get easier now that the place is a crater. But what else do I know? There was only one other survivor from that place, and you killed him. It's the same thing as blowing the place up. Now I'm the only one who remembers what happened there. I want it gone. I want it all gone. It's only in my head, and when I die, it dies. Do you think you're different now? I know that place is gone. But I still kind of want to kill every person I see. No offense. Now let's talk about Morden. Morden's mission is one of my favorites, and is the one that deals with the most internal reconciliation of any of the characters in the game, even though it may not seem like that at first glance. Morden wants to look for a former colleague that he believes has been kidnapped on Tachanka. Morden has defended and seems quite proud of the research he did in modifying the genophage and all the conversations you've had with him up to this point. But it is in this mission that Morden must confront what has happened to Tachanka and deal with the idea that perhaps he was wrong to do what he did. That perhaps if the Krogan had been allowed to repopulate, that they may have undergone a cultural renaissance. Throughout this mission, we discover the tossed away corpses of victims of genophage experimentation. The first body we come across is a human body. Morden seems repulsed by this. Experimenting on humans? That kind of crap is what makes Cerberus start to seem like a good idea. Never used humans myself. Disgusting, unethical, sloppy. Used by brute force researchers, not thinkers. No place in proper science. It's here that Morden's biases about Krogan culture, however well informed they may be, start to show. When we ask him, if he had to use live test subjects when testing the genophage modifications, Morden says that this was unnecessary. He used simulations, corpses, and cloned tissue with later high-level tests on Varen, as they are native to Tachanka. Morden's bar for ethics is that he never tested on species capable of calculus, but yet only species he deems intelligent. Apparently, Krogan do not count, as he deployed a virus that did far worse things to their population than he could ever have done experimenting on live Varen. Perhaps he holds Varen above Krogan. His bar for morality seems to be off, but he doesn't seem to think it needs calibration. When we ask him why he thought it was okay to do what he did to the Krogan, seeing the aftermath... How can you agree with using the genophage, Morton? Look at what happened to Tuchanka as a result. The state of Tuchanka not due to genophage. Nuclear winter caused by Krogan before Salarians made first contact. Krogan choices, refuse truce during Krogan rebellions, expand after Rachni wars, splinter after genophage. Genophage medical, not nuclear. No craters from virus, damage caused by Krogan, not Salarians, not me. Morden blames nuclear winter on their current state, evading the question as to whether their continued war, piracy, competition to mate, and the caste system that comes from the scarcity of female Krogan, and concentrates on how they ruin their own homeworld before first contact. He is adept at avoiding blame, and for someone so smart, he doesn't seem to see the obvious question. How can a race where one out of 1,000 pregnancies survive to term possibly colonize another, perhaps better, world? They live in squalor on a dying, harsh planet because there is very little choice. They fight for money to prove their worth for a chance to mate. Females are highly sought after and guarded like treasure. Would this have continued if the genophage had been cured? It's hard to tell, but Morden believes he knows. Morden finally breaks, and we see the side of him that has his doubts, that needed to search his soul for an answer. Was this the right thing to do? Was there another choice? Rest, young mother. Find your gods. Find someplace better. I didn't expect spirituality from you, Morden. Genophage modification project altered millions of lives, then saw results. Ego, humility, juxtaposition, frailty of life, size of universe. Explored religions after work completed. Different races. No answers. 
many questions. Sounds like you were trying to deal with your guilty conscience. The Doctor killed millions. Modified Genophage Project great in scope, scientifically brilliant, but ethically difficult. Krogan reaction visceral, tragic, not guilty, but responsible. Trained as Doctor, Genophage affects fertility, doesn't kill, still caused this. Hard to see big picture behind pile of corpses. Can you really just rationalize it all away? How do you justify it? Wheel of life. Popular Salarian concept. Similar to human Hinduism in focus on reincarnation. Appealing to see life as endless. Fix mistakes in next life. Learn. Adapt. Improve. Refuse to believe life ends here. Too wasteful. Have more to offer. Mistakes to fix. Cannot end here. Could do so much more. If you need this much soul-searching to get over it, maybe the genophage was wrong. Had to be done. Brachni wars, Krogan rebellions, all pointed to Krogan aggression. So many simulations. Effects of Krogan population increase. All pointed to war. Extinction. Genophage or genocide. Save galaxy from Krogan. Save Krogan from galaxy. So you're willing to sterilize a species based on the evidence of a few simulations? Yes. Millions of data points, years of arguments, countless scenarios, all noted Krogan fragmentation as dangerous, no unified culture to support repopulation. Would have been war, Turians and humans destroying Krogan utterly. Genophage was better. Saved lives. You could have cured the Genophage instead. Brought hope to the Krogan. They'd have rejoiced. Assumes human reaction. Krogan stimulus response different. Harsh environment. Take chance to fight. Flee. Would have caused chaos on Tuchanka. Victor would have war economy. Bloodthirsty army. Galactic expansion only logical outcome. More war. Genophage saved lives. War would have ended. We need to find Malin and shut this place down. Yes. Here we see the beginnings of Morton's resolve cracking. He reflects on his past and admits that it is hard to see the good through all the bad, but when we find Malin alive and unharmed working on a genophage, Morden nearly cracks completely. He wasn't kidnapped. He came here voluntarily to cure the genophage. Impossible. Whole team agreed. Project necessary. How was I supposed to disagree with the great Dr. Solus? I was your student. I looked up to you. Experiments performed here. Live subjects, prisoners, torture and executions. You're doing? We've already got the blood of millions on our hands, Doctor. If it takes a bit more to put things right, I can deal with that. In the end, Morden realizes that it was hard for him to see the truth about Malin. Hard to see anything right while he was still in pain. In the end, the only thing that remained of Malin was his research. Morden hesitates, however, when deciding what to do with his research. If Morden believed that the Krogan were our lost cause, there was no point to keeping the data. He would have wiped it then and there. Malin's research, only loose end, could destroy it. Closure, security. Still valuable, though. If you think it could be useful, why not hang on to it? Worked for years to create modified genophage. Should destroy this. Malin's work could cure genophage. Don't know. Effects on Krogan. Effects on galaxy. Too many variables. Too many variables. You regret what the Krogan have become. You see the horror of what they did here, but you see the loss, too. Wasted potential. They don't deserve this, Morton. Save the data. Point taken, Shepard. Capturing data. Wiping local copy. In the end, it's easy to get him to keep the data and erase the local copy. Back on the ship, we find out that the research has been tossed aside by Morton, and he makes an obvious attempt to convince us that he's too busy to look at it. And through this final bit of dialogue, we learn a lot about the Salarians. They are a short-lived species, and because they are short-lived, they deal with their emotions a lot quicker than humans do. To a Salarian, once the past is done, it is done. Well, in this case, Morden thought he was done with the past, but the past wasn't quite done with him. Mass Effect 2 has a lot going for it right out the gate. The fact that the things you did in a previous game would be recognized here, for better or worse, was the first time I, for one, had seen anything like it. The game dumbed down RPG systems, its streamlined team powers had easy combat, a severe lack of variety in weapons and armor, 
and lack of weighty choices in the early game. So what is the point of playing it? Why do I play this game so much? Well, because Mass Effect 2 gives meaning to the choices you made in Mass Effect 1, and that is its greatest gift. And this has been a rant from strategy, and now that you've heard it, go play some games.